So this session is on antibodies, but uh, the truth is, in all of the sessions, there's been talk of antibodies and talk of T cells and talk of uh, immune suppression pathways, and all of these are all interdigitated. Uh, so uh, now in uh, 2015, uh, as we think about the various ways that we can be having an impact against cancer, uh, when we think about monoclonal antibodies, we need to think not only about antibodies that are reacting against uh, the tumor cells, but antibodies that are reacting against elements of the tumor, both stroma, uh, immune components, and non-immune components. And there's really two categories of these reagents. One are those that act directly on the tumor, recognizing it specifically and activating effector mechanisms and going downstream from there. And others are antibodies that might be recognizing something else and might be influencing the overall response. Uh, an important thing to remember for these antibodies, though, is unlike some small molecules which might be blocking very specific pathways, I think we can be thinking about these molecules, antibodies, as keys to open up the entire immune system. And that's, I think, what the goal of this uh, session is going to be, and you'll hear this in many of the talks. So with respect to opening up the entire immune system, there's so many different cell populations that can be involved. I'm just trying to see how to get this pointer working. There it is. Okay. So while the monoclonal antibody might be recognizing the tumor initially, uh, we want to be getting a variety of other cells involved and being aware of them as we're trying to incorporate immunotherapy in 2015. Clearly, there are cells of the innate immune system. Each has separate pathways and ways we can try and take advantage of them. T cells are playing a major role, and there's a number of ways that they're very important. Uh, we can be using adaptive transfer of these cells and need to be aware of the many cells and pathways that are trying to prevent uh, our immune efforts from having an effect against the cancer. For our perspective at University of Wisconsin and the group that I'm collaborating with, uh, one of the main focuses that we have is to try and use these approaches to have an impact on cancer where we're trying to combine these various uh, modalities and hoping that we can use approaches that are easy to expand to a worldwide or at least national kind of COG studies because we'd like to be able to take agents that are off the shelf and apply them in a large way to many patients with cancer. So the story in part begins back in the late 1980s, at least for me, when I had the privilege of uh, going and visiting Nai Kong Chung at the Memorial Sloan Kettering and also going to a study section at the NCI and sitting on a study section right next to Ralph Reisfeld. And at that time, we had been developing IL-2 because we had been interested in T cells, and we had learned that IL-2 administration of patients was turning on NK cells, which I had not ever been interested in before. But since we could turn on a lot of them, we wondered what might they be good for. Uh, in talking with uh, both Ralph and Nikong, it seemed that antibodies can bind to tumor cells, but they don't do a very good job of killing tumors by themselves. Uh, the death is induced by white cells that have FC receptors that recognize the tumor-coated antibody, and based on that, we and others hypothesized that if you activated the white cells at the same time, you'd get better ADCC. So Jackie Hank, who is here in the meeting uh, uh, today, uh, tested white cells and natural killer cells from healthy individuals and showed that if, if, if you test them against neuroblastoma cells that we received from Bob Seeger, pediatric oncologists are a great collaborative group. They help each other all the time. So we got these uh, neuroblastoma cells, showed that we could use the IL-2 and the antibody together to get augmented ADCC against them, particularly when we had both the antibody and the IL-2 together at the same time. Well, that made sense until we took cells from patients with cancer. Cancer is immunosuppressive, not only to T cells, but to NK cells. And although patients have NK cells that function, they don't function as well as healthy donors. And Jackie showed this, and we saw a little bit of activation with IL-2 and antibody in these cells from a patient with cancer. This happened to be an adult with renal cell cancer that was referred to our team to get our clinical regimen of IL-2. And this renal cancer patient had only had surgery for their cancer and no other treatment but the patient was dramatically immune suppressed. That patient got the IL-2, and a month later, we took peripheral blood lymphocytes from the patient, and now the same patient showed really dramatic ADCC in vitro as long as we had the antibody and IL-2 there together. So we thought we should try and make this happen in patients, uh, and uh, uh, over the next 10 years, we did a series of in vitro studies and mouse studies and phase one and phase two studies, both in melanoma and in neuroblastoma through the COG. We learned a lot and decided through the COG that in order to test this, we needed to set up a randomized trial. Uh, 
We started working on this back in 1997 before the COG was the COG. Uh, separate neuroblastoma researchers from the POG and from the CCG met together at the O'Hare Airport and realized we needed to have one national study. We also realized that there were a lot of things that we could do to try and help make the uh, efficacy better. LSU and Nikong had been studying GMCSF for its ability to activate ADCC by neutrophils and macrophages. We had been using IL-2. We came up with a regimen that used both of these cytokines, but in alternating cycles. That was one uh, step that we made to try and get multiple pathways involved. The next step that we took, though, is much preclinical data was arguing that antibody approaches aren't working in bulky tumors both because of difficulty penetrating into the interstitial space, but also the larger the tumor, the more immunosuppressive the environment through T-regulatory cells and myeloid-derived suppressor cells and hypoxia and other things we've heard about in the last two days. So we decided to treat patients in remission. We did a large randomized study, and I think most of you are familiar with the results, which COG published uh, five years ago, showing that the children that had gone through all of the upfront chemotherapy and autologous transplant surgery and radiation therapy once then randomized to either retinoic acid or retinoic acid plus this immunotherapy regimen, we're doing better as far as both event-free survival and overall survival. So this has become the standard COG approach, and for many neuroblastoma centers around the world, this approach or something somewhat like it are now being used to treat neuroblastoma. It's good news that we improved event-free survival. However, 60% of these patients who made it through transplant are still relapsing from their neuroblastoma. We've got to do something much better than this. The next step is to take that anti-GD2 antibody and genetically engineer it. We've been working with Ralph Reisfeld and Steve Gillies on a molecule that is a fusion protein that has put IL-2 on the carboxy terminus of the immunoglobulin heavy chain. Uh, the idea was to let this antibody mediate ADCC, but also let it bind to IL-2 receptors on NK cells or T cells and help bridge those cells directly to the tumor cells and facilitate activity. This works very well in mouse models. Uh, this work done by Holger Day when he was working in Ralph Reisfeld's laboratory showed that mice with uh, IV-injected neuroblastoma have lots of metastases. Each bar is a separate mouse. If you take those animals and instead treat them with the chimeric antibody and IL-2, very much similar to the clinical protocol we're using currently, uh, these animals had smaller tumors and fewer of them, but they still had tumors. Well, if you use the same molar amount of this antibody in IL-2, but given as a fusion protein in these mice, you now don't see any cancer in those animals. Well, that's if you treat these animals only one day after the uh, tumor was put in intravenously. Uh, Zane Neal and Sasha Rachmelovich in our lab tried to make this a bit more clinically relevant by injecting the neuroblastoma IV, treating with this same fusion protein called an immunocytokine, but we started the treatment at varying times after the tumor was introduced. And you can see that depending upon when the immunotherapy was begun, you see dramatically different results. If you start on day five, you get clearance in virtually all animals, but the later you start, the less effective it is. Again, consistent with the prior data that these approaches are not going to work in bulkier measurable disease. So why is it that the IL-2 linked to the antibody seems to be working better? Uh, we've done a fair amount of work on this preclinically, both in vivo in mice and in vitro. I'll just give one schema that shows some of what we think is going on. When you treat a tumor cell with an anti-GD2 antibody, the antibody binds to the antigen through its anti-GD2 uh, FAB end, and then it can mediate ADCC through the FC end of that antibody. When you take this, F when you take this antibody linked to IL-2, and now bind it to a natural killer cell that has IL-2 receptors. It also binds, but it binds through the IL-2 end of the fusion protein, binding to IL-2 receptors. When you mix these two entities together and let them form synapses, now all of the fusion protein that had been on the natural killer cell forms an active synapse with the tumor cell, and all of the IL-2 receptors polarize. So unlike what happens in nature, where IL-2 receptors are always seeing soluble IL-2, what we're really doing is coating a tumor cell with IL-2. And your IL-2 receptor-bearing cells are now seeing an IL-2-coated tumor cell, and the IL-2 receptors are allowing a synapse to form through it and give better ADCC and better activity in vivo.
So this has moved forward in phase one and phase two studies. A phase two study that we published a few years ago that was done through the COG treated patients with relapsed neuroblastoma. Some of those patients had bulky disease. You can see by MRI or CT scan. Those are the stratum one patients. Some of those patients had less bulky disease that you could not measure by CT or MRI, but you could evaluate it by MIBG scan or by bone marrow aspirate and see neuroblastoma in the bone marrow. Uh, we treated these patients in a standard phase two approach, and the results had some patients showing benefit. Those patients that had bulky disease, the stratum one patients, none of 13 patients showed any response. Those patients that were in stratum two that had only the MIBG or marrow aspirate detectable disease, maybe a log or so less tumor on board, uh, five of those patients had CR, and two also showed clear clinical improvement. So the study wasn't designed or powered to ask the question, but we did the t-test, and we compared 7 out of 24 versus 0 of 13, and the results were uh, statistically significant, suggesting that if you can make it happen in mice, you should be able to show that it happens in patients if the situation simulates that. So that's the good news. Uh, a recent study has been done confirming this, a separate phase two study done by the COG, and these results were presented by Susie Schusterman at ASCO this summer. The bad news is that we're limited in the amount of this fusion protein that we're able to give because it has a fixed amount of IL-2 on it, and we're seeing IL-2 toxicity in these patients associated with it. So we're not giving as much of the antibody as when we're giving antibody by itself in the separate regimen. So how could we decrease the IL-2 toxicity and make this a more uh, appropriate therapy to be able to expand in a big way? So we're working with Steve Gillies, who has taken this antibody IL-2 fusion protein and asked what, we, what, what could he do to try and modify the IL-2 toxicity associated with it. So this is the three-dimensional diagram of the current immunocytokine, the uh, FAB under the antibody, the FC under the antibody, and the IL-2 on the heavy chain uh, of each uh, heavy chain. You can see that the IL-2 is sort of floating in the breeze, and so because of that, it can interact very easily with IL-2 receptors, either of the high affinity or intermediate affinity types. Steve hypothesized that if he moves the IL-2 from the immunoglobulin heavy chain to the end of the immunoglobulin light chain, because of the three-dimensional conformation of the antibody, the IL-2 is going to be a bit tucked into the structure of this molecule, making it available to alpha, beta, gamma high affinity receptors, but making it less available, but still somewhat recognizable by the beta, gamma receptors. This was our goal because we feel that the toxicity associated with IL-2 is caused by these intermediate affinity receptor-bearing NK cells that are releasing a lot of cytokine and causing the IL-2 uh, toxicity. So we've taken this approach, and the, the goal then is to be able to take this molecule with the IL-2 on the immunoglobulin light chain uh, and have it not activate the intermediate affinity receptors when it's in soluble form, but when it's bound to the tumor cell to let those cells mediate ADCC and also to be able to have high affinity IL-2 receptor bearing cells see the IL-2 mediate both ADCC and also this IL-2 facilitated synapse conjugation. Zulmarie Perez-Horta, a graduate student in my laboratory, has been working with these. This is a complex slide, but I'd like you to focus first on the top and to look at particularly the red and the black lines. Uh, what you see here are human cells that have either high affinity IL-2 receptors or intermediate affinity IL-2 receptors. The black line is soluble IL-2. The red line is the immunocytokine, the standard one that has IL-2 on the immunoglobulin heavy chain, the one that we call human 1418 IL-2. You can see on human high affinity or intermediate affinity cells, those curves are superimposable. Uh, this is what we're seeing when we give this drug to patients, and at the doses we're giving, we're seeing IL-2 toxicity we'd like to do something with. Remember, in the mouse, we're seeing anti-tumor efficacy, and we're not seeing any IL-2 toxicity. So how do these same two molecules work on mouse cells? So here we're looking at mouse cells with high affinity IL-2 receptors or intermediate affinity IL-2 receptors. In this case, you can see the red line, namely the immunocytokine, looks pretty similar to the soluble IL-2 on high affinity receptors. But on the intermediate affinity receptors, it's at least a log less potent 
on the mouse intermediate affinity receptors, showing that when you put the human IL-2 onto the immunoglobulin heavy chain, there must be some conformational change in the IL-2 that's making it less recognizable to the lower affinity intermediate affinity mouse receptors. So this is the kind of biology we're seeing in the mouse where we're seeing the kind of anti-tumor effect we want. What it tells us is what we really would like is a molecule that works in human with the same kind of curves as you're seeing here in mouse. So now I'd like you to look at the blue line. The blue lines up here on the human cells are what we get with this newer immunocytokine where the IL-2 is put on the end of the immunoglobulin light chain. On the high affinity receptor cells where we want it to be active, the curves are superimposed. On the intermediate affinity human uh, cells, it's down by roughly a log, just where we think we'd like it to be. So we'd like to move ahead with clinical testing of this, but of course we believe in preclinical modeling and we'd like to do some more preclinical in vivo data with this first. The trouble is, because mouse receptors and human receptors are different, if we take this molecule with the IL-2 on the light chain and now move it into the mouse, it's binding much less well, not at all, on the intermediate affinity receptors. So what Steve is in the process of doing is creating a surrogate that we can use in the mouse that's going to mimic these kind of curves that we see in human, and that work still has to be moved ahead into in vivo testing. I'd like to switch now to the cure molecules. Uh, this is what uh, Rupert covered in some great detail, and I was sort of counting on him to cover it in detail, and he said he'd count on me to do it, but I, I think he covered it pretty well. So I'm going to give just a couple slides on it. He really focused on the importance of cure with the setting of allogeneic recognition, and the initial terminology that was used for this was alloreactive cure cells, or alloreactive NK cells based on their alloreactive cure. I'd like to get away from the alloreactive terminology because we're not doing anything allo in this setting. We're looking at the patient's own NK cell's ability to respond to their own tumor. But the concept of the cure receptors interacting with the HLA molecules in the allo setting still applies in the autologous setting. It's a bit confusing. Roughly 40% of the population has a repertoire for their cure receptors and a repertoire for their cure ligands, HLA, that has every one of the cure receptors they've inherited on their 19th chromosome correspond to HLA molecules they've inherited on their 6th chromosome. These people are thus cure, cure ligand matched. Roughly 60% of the population, however, have inherited some cure receptor for which they have not inherited an HLA molecule on their 6th chromosome. So for them, at least some of their cure receptors are not going to see the HLA. They won't be inhibited. You expect them to have slightly more potent NK function, and the terminology used here is these patients have a cure ligand that's missing. Sometimes this is referred to as mismatch, but it's a little better to think of it as a cure ligand missing. They've got better NK function. So in the setting of autologous transplant, not allogeneic transplant, the team from St. Jude and the team from Sloan Kettering published some years ago that you have some benefit after autologous transplant for pediatric solid tumors, largely neuroblastoma, if you have a cure ligand missing over all ligands present. We looked at these data and thought, we really don't think this has to do with the transplant itself. It has to do with how the natural killer cells work. So we went back to the phase two study that I had shown before where we had seven patients out of 38 in the study show some clinical benefit, and we did the cure-cure ligand genotyping on them, and all seven of those patients that showed some benefit were in the cure mismatch uh, ligand missing group. It's a small study, uh, but did have a significant p-value, suggesting first that the interaction between cure and cure ligand still makes a difference when you're trying to work with ADCC. As much as giving the antibody allows you to get better killing, even in the presence of that ADCC, the level of that killing is modified by these cure-cure ligand relationships. Second, clinically, it says some of what we were seeing in our responses of these patients was probably mediated in vivo by NK cells. So after this work came out, the Sloan Kettering team, uh, in a terrific paper by Tarek et al., uh, led by Nai Kong and his collaborator Catherine Shu, looked at the cure-cure ligand data from a large cohort of patients that got treated for neuroblastoma, not in relapse, but up, up front, 
and they were able to show both for patients that uh, did, did not get a transplant and those that did get a transplant, the cure ligand missing population did better in this session, set, setting. So it's not the transplant that makes the difference, it's the NK cells. So summarizing where we're at so far, uh, when you're giving systemic delivery of a tumor reactive antibody trying to mediate ADCC, uh, treating in the setting of minimal residual disease is important. Uh, clearly, NK cells are playing a role, both based on preclinical and clinical data. Well, that's okay for those patients that you can get into remission. But unfortunately, even in 2015, we got a lot of patients that were not able to get into remission or things that we'd like to do for patients that have bulky disease for whatever reason, we're not able to get them into the state of minimal residual disease. Is there anything we can do with these kinds of antibody-mediated approaches that might have an impact on patients with measurable disease? And that's what I'd like to focus the rest of this talk on. And the two things I'd like to focus on are first, instead of giving antibodies systemically, to talk about direct intratumoral de delivery of antibody, which seems counterintuitive. The whole reason to give an antibody, you'd think, is it can seek out the tumor no matter where it is and get to microscopic metastatic sites. The second thing I'd like to talk about is using in this in combination with other immunotherapies that seem to be additive or potentially synergistic. So uh, Eric Johnson was a surgical resident who came and worked in our laboratory with Sasha Rachmelovich, and he asked whether the immunocytokine given directly into a tumor in mouse would make a difference. So he treated tumors in this model that were a little bit bigger than tumors that could respond if we gave the molecule IV. He showed that if he gave uh, these animals intravenous immunocytokine, it clearly slowed tumor growth, but it didn't eradicate the tumors. If he gave the same dose by the same schedule of the immunocytokine as a direct needle and syringe injection into the tumors, he saw a much better anti-tumor effect. And more important than the growth curves is the uh, is the results as far as tumor-free survival. So when you give the agent intratumorally, 70% uh, of these animals are tumor-free compared to less than 20% when you give it intravenously. So intratumoral seems to be helping. Uh, next, Richard Yang and uh, Nick Calagriopoulos in our lab uh, asked what could be going on in the microenvironment of these tumors to allow the intratumoral immunocytokine to be making such a difference. And even though we had shown previously with intravenous immunocytokine that it's largely an NK effect and we can have it work in animals that don't have T cells, in this setting with the intratumoral immunocytokine, they were able to show a great increase in the number of both NK cells and T cells directly in these tumors. So to active ask if this had functional significance, they treated animals with the tumor with the intratumoral immunocytokine and were able to show under these conditions, in this case this was the NXS2 neuroblastoma, GD2 expressing, uh, about two-thirds of the animals were remaining tumor-free, but if they depleted either T cells or NK cells, they lost the response. So it was an example where the NK cells are mediating ADCC initially and turning on the right microenvironment to then get T cells involved to be able to give adaptive immunity and synergize in the response. <clears throat> Why is it that the intratumoral injection is giving this? This isn't rocket science. You put the drug directly into the tumor and the amount of drug that sticks to the tumor cells is a lot more than if you give the drug intravenously. So Richard did this by giving the drug either intravenously or directly into the tumor, and he harvested these tumors at various times after the injection, and then looked by flow cytometry to see how much of this fusion protein was actually sticking to the tumor cells. And you can see at least for the first many hours, you've got roughly 100-fold more fusion protein stuck to the tumor cells when you give it intratumorally than intravenously, and that must be doing something to potentiate not only ADCC, but also an environment to turn on this T-cell kind of response. Next is how can we try and get better results by synergizing with other agents? So Sasha Rachmelovich wanted to treat tumors that were a little bit larger. So he took uh, slightly larger tumors, and in this case, all of the data I'm going to show from now on are with the B78 uh, melanoma grows in C57 black 6 mice. It's a derivative of B16 that expresses GD2 because it was transfected with the GD2 synthase. So if he treats these tumors on day seven, 
and he treats them just with the immunocytokine, he sees slowing of tumor growth, that's this green line compared to the control line. If he treats with anti-CTLA-4 in this melanoma model, there's really no effect. That's the red line. But if he combines both, now you're seeing a much more dramatic effect, very statistically significant with more animals surviving long term. Now that's if you start treating these animals on day seven. Same exact system, same combination, immunocytokine intratumorally along with CTLA-4. The only difference is let's start treating on day 12. Tumors are a little bit bigger. Now the combination therapy is slowing tumor growth, but all these mice are having the tumors continue to grow. It's another way of saying the amount of immunotherapy that you need is influenced by the size of the tumor and the other things happening downstream from big tumors. Sasha has been very interested in macrophage activation, and I don't have time to go into the pathways and the rationale behind it, but he's been looking at the combination of an anti-CD40 agonist antibody, an antibody that's being used to treat adults with pancreatic cancer by Bob von der Heide at Penn. Uh, we've shown preclinically that if we combine this with a TLR agonist, we see potent effects in very small tumors in mice uh, when those two are combined with a TLR agonist. Uh, in this setting, where Sasha is treating the same B78 tumor, but now treating tumors that are day 23, if you treat with the immunocytokine and anti-CTLA-4, there you slow the tumor, but they're still growing. If you treat with the anti-CD40 and TLR agonist, it slows the tumor, but they're still growing. But if you put both together, you take these pretty macroscopic tumors and have them shrink with at least a fraction of them remaining tumor-free and developing lasting adaptive tumor-specific immunity. So the last example I want to give, which is a bit longer, is that of uh, work being done by Zach Morris in our laboratory. Zach has asked whether you can use radiation therapy, not in a therapeutic mode, but in a microenvironment altering mode, giving a single dose of only 12 gray of radiation to see how this might modify the way the immunotherapy is working. So the uh, schema that he's using is he takes uh, these mice, injects them with a B78 tumor, uh, lets the tumor grow for five weeks so that it's now 200 cubic millimeters, uh, shields the animal and irradiates the tumor with a single dose of 12 gray, waits another six days and then gives the intratumoral immunocytokine and follows to see how these animals are doing. And the results shown in this slide uh, show that the control animals that got no treatment in the yellow line have tumors that are really growing. Uh, animals that are getting either the radiation alone or the immunocytokine alone have the tumors still growing, while the animals having these relatively large tumors getting the combined therapy have the tumors shrink with, at day 60, all animals alive, and 73% of them are tumor-free. To show that these animals uh, uh, have turned on a T-cell response, he's looked directly in the tumors by immunohistochemistry, and he's showing both NK cells and T-cells what you see uh, here are the animals that got the radiation and the immunocytokine, and that's where we see this bright staining. Uh, the graph just quantifies these data, and what this shows, in the absence of the radiation, immunocytokine clearly increases T cell infiltration in the tumor. Radiation by itself doesn't do anything to the T cells, but the combination of radiation and immunocytokine gives you this really dramatic difference in T cell infiltration. So he asked what kind of T-cell responses we've got in these animals. So he took the animals that were treated with the immunocytokine after radiation, became tumor-free, and after an additional 10 weeks, challenged them with the same primary tumor. And what you can see is that the animals that had been cured of the initial tumor showed a 90% of them were able to reject a rechallenge of the same tumor, while animals that are uh, made surgically tumor-free showed a uh, growth of these tumors, uh, and uh, the others are just the naive control animals. Uh, next, uh, he took those animals that were made tumor-free and was able to challenge them with either the B16 parental tumor or alternatively a pancreatic cancer that has no immunologic cross-reactivity and was able to show that these animals could reject the B16 showing clear epitope spread while they did not reject the pancreatic tumor, uh, so this was tumor specific. 
Uh, I'm going to skip these next slides for the sake of time. They uh, end up showing that at least one mechanism involved is the augmentation of FAS expression by these irradiated tumor cells. This is uh, accounting for some of this response, and he was able to show that in animals that are FAS ligand deficient, we didn't see these responses at all. The last data I want to show is this one slide, uh, and this is taking tumors that are really macroscopic in mice. Now we're waiting six weeks after the tumor was injected. They're now 500 cubic millimeters, and he's looked at animals that are getting treated with either radiation or the intratumoral immunocytokine or anti-CTLA-4. And no one of those treatments does anything to influence tumor growth. When you take those three separate treatments and combine them in any two-way combination, the tumors are all still growing. But if you treat with the intratumoral immunocytokine after radiation and anti-CTLA-4, now these large tumors are shrinking away and these animals have tumor-specific T-cell memory. So we're eager to try and move this kind of combination into clinical testing for macroscopic tumors. So in summary, ADCC is augmented by cytokine or other ways of activating the effector cells. Immunocytokine is more potent than monoclonal antibody in a variety of preclinical settings. Uh, clinically, the immunocytokine involves NK activation when you're giving it intravenously. Intratumoral administration, at least in the preclinical setting, is working better than IV treatment, and a number of programs are moving into this kind of approach for other immunotherapies in the clinical setting, particularly the work being done by Holbrook Court and Ron Levy at Stanford, where Crystal is going, uh, have made a lot of progress with intratumoral injections of immunotherapy. These therapies can synergize with radiation therapy. Uh, they can synergize with checkpoint blockade. Uh, and while the work I've shown has really focused on anti-GD2 expressing tumors as a model, there are a number of tumors that are recognized by monoclonal antibodies, as we've heard at the, this meeting over the last two days. And I think these principles could potentially be applied to any monoclonal antibody approach to cancer therapy. So I want to thank you and thank the people working directly in my lab, I've tried to mention those who've generated data I've shown, and mention also the many collaborators within our cancer center, uh, many collaborators through COG, through St. Jude, uh, industrial collaborators at Provenance and BMS and Apiron, and uh, uh, Ralph Reisfeld who helped get this all started, and then the research support that was essential to doing this. So I'll end there. Thanks very much. <laughs>